Well, thank you for having me. It's actually a pleasure to be invited by LTU Unit and the interesting things that they do here. So let me start just by saying um, this is a workshop to talk about flipped classroom. So it would be quite an irony if I am going to talk about flipped classroom and I stay here with my PowerPoint talking at you for two hours, right? I will put you to sleep. And it's been a while since I've done that, actually. I don't do it that often. So what I'm going to do is actually the opposite. I'm going to step out of here. And what we're going to do in the middle of the workshop, I'm going to ask you to answer questions, talk to your neighbor, answer some things, use your device to vote. In other words, I'm going to use what I typically use in some of my flipped learning or flipped classroom scenarios. Um, probably something's going to go wrong. Something's not going to work. But it's the best way for you to experience what is actually a flipped classroom. Some things work. Some others don't work. And it's part of the choreography, OK? So if you look at the screen right now, um, the slides that you're going to be seeing, uh, you can download them from my SlideShare account. I also put their Twitter account just in case any of you is uh, um, familiar with Twitter and wants to drop some messages there or some feedback. I'll make sure I'll read that afterwards. So here's the plan for the next two hours. Um, you can interrupt at any time, OK? Any question, any comment, just raise your hand. If you're hiding behind the column, I'll try to make sure that I see you. Scream, interrupt, it's no problem. We have to make this interactive. Let's face it, again, if it's me only talking for two hours, you don't want that, OK? I'm sure you don't want that. So first, I'm going to go very briefly about what it is, the flipped classroom. And I'm going to look at your faces. And if you're looking at it, like, OK, we know that. So I'll, I'll keep going faster, faster, and faster. So if you want me to really stop and clarify something, just raise your hand and say, but. And that'll be the cue for me to say, OK, maybe I shouldn't go that fast, all right? Then we're going to explore a little bit what's out there. What is the typical scenario for a flipped classroom? And let's focus on the ingredients, the essence. Then is when I'm going to ask you to work, the plan. We're going to do a very quick drill. You're going to pick an objective from your course, whatever you feel comfortable with. You're going to pick what kind of activities would you like your students to perform before they show up to class. And you're going to pick then the activity that you're going to do in class, which is what I'm doing here right now. And then we'll talk about the issues that may uh, arise from that. OK, so there'll be practical work in there. And finally, I'm, I'm going to give you a few samples of things that are out there. Um, talking about the technology, because as we will see, Flip classroom now is in fashion because partially because of technology. All right, does that make sense? All right. So, what is it? How fast should I go? Well, the first thing I should like I would like to say is that flip classroom in fact doesn't exist. All right. So it's nothing new. It's just a term that came now back to refer to something that let's put the students to work while we talk to each other, and we need a name for that. So somebody said, oh, maybe we should call it the flip classroom. Oh, that's something new. No, it's not. It's a strategy. It's basically a strategy. So you should maybe forget about what is this new thing called flipped classroom. 60, 70, 80% of it is common sense. It's just that maybe we need to review it. So that's probably the right approach. Okay. So um, the idea is old, but why did it come back? Why all of a sudden we are all getting excited about putting the students to work or putting the students to do previous activities? Come on, you can find people in the 70s doing that. So why is that? So it's basically two reasons. First, we push ahead on this simple transfer of information. People are standing up there and let me tell you the way it is. And we are beginning to see that it doesn't work, or it doesn't quite work. Or maybe you phrase it in a different way, or maybe it could be improved. Pick your favorite. All right? So this is the first realization. And we've been struggling with that for quite some time, I believe. The second one, perhaps the most important, is technology. Now we have resources everywhere. People have videos of all sorts of things. And sometimes the resources that are out there, free, instantaneous access are much better than the ones that I have, <laughs> right? Uh, it used to be the case I was the guardian of my course notes. And my course notes was, that was my treasure. So I go to the room, it's like, I got my notes here, and you are going to have the pleasure of having access to my notes. Well, guess what? There are much better notes out there. So that also kind of like shaked the ground a little bit. It's like, oh, maybe the flip classroom now is the way to go, all right? So we'll elaborate a little bit more on that. And then the final realization, face-to-face -face value, we don't pay attention to this, is face-to-face -face time is incredibly valuable. Look at how many of you are here now, devoting two hours of your time to discuss. So I don't know about you, but what I would think is like me talking all the time here in the middle of the room would be a huge waste of time because I could have given you a document with the things that I have to tell you or a video. I could record a video and say, here, and you watch that video whenever you have time. So face-to-face 
interaction is incredibly valuable. So the challenge is to make the most out of it. You should get the most out of this workshop. And I think the most out of this workshop is for us interacting. You doing some work, voting, let's discuss, let's put some difficult questions out there. Let me, see, let me hear your opinion. That's something we, we can do because we are looking at each other. We are face to face, all right? You cannot do that with a video. So this distinction is becoming a bit more real or a bit more um, important. So all these things are pushing us towards, all right, let's, let's give it a shot to this flipped classroom. So as you can see, I asked you to do some work previous to come here, all right? In the pure spirit of flipped classroom. Why? Because I could put you here the two minute video explaining what is flipped classroom. But I thought it was a total waste of time because you can watch that video on your own and then come here and you know about this, that already. And that's the reason why I send you an email and say, please do that in the spirit of flipped classroom. Now, what happened? <laughs> you know where this thing is going, huh? <laughs> what happened? 33 people returned the feedback. Is anybody shocked? Yes. Actually, we have been playing this game between you and I the last 48 hours. See if I could put there the exact number of people that actually did the slides. So I've been, you know, touching my slides until the very last minute when I realized there in my computer there's still three more people submitted the feedback while I was already with my slides there. <laughs> so it's not 33, it's 36. All right? Uh, out of 67 people, though, visited the form. So right there, I have half of you went to the form. It's like, oh, interesting, yeah. Um, that's it. You didn't submit anything which is okay. That's the other realization, all right? We tend to be very precise academics. We are a special kind. We tend to be very strict and precise. Well, half of you went through the feedback. Uh, six or seven of you, actually, they did it this morning, all right? Somebody as late as midnight yesterday. Uh, somebody as early as seven in the morning. <laughs> okay, but that's okay. That's okay. It's no problem. I mean, I'm not saying this because I'm shocked. I'm saying this because we have to feel at ease with that information. That's okay. That's the way we all work, all right? It's not a problem. It's not a problem. And half of you didn't have time or didn't consider this was important, or maybe that's not so essential for the workshop. That's fine, too. You are totally entitled to think that. And that, this is my point. When you deploy a flipped classroom scenario, you have to factor this in. Half of the people won't do that previous. And I have no idea what I'm getting into. Yes. Exactly. Extremely good point. So common sense. If you set out an activity, put an estimate on the duration. Great. I'll get back to that point uh, a little bit later. But that's an excellent type of feedback. OK? Yeah. Uh, another thing, I, I went up on a tangent. So I got into the first YouTube. <laughs> and uh, there was one on narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> and? And this is the reason why this type of seminar is one of the most difficult ones that I'm giving in my life. Why? Because this is the toughest audience ever. <laughs> why? Because you ask them to do this activity, they'll do that, but wait. All right? Or they want to know exactly how many minutes it's going to last. And I know, but that's OK. I went to a flipped classroom presentation last week, and the first thing they did was they actually put up who had done activities oh. and who hadn't. Oh. And I must have forgotten to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. All right. So I could have done I could have done something like that if I would add like the name field. But here's the middle ground. So I come here and say half of you did the work, half of you didn't do the work, and that's okay. And we got a discussion already going, which is perfect. I achieved my objective. All right. And some of you might be thinking, well, not this one, but the following seminar, maybe I should, you know, do something like this. So my vision is five, ten years from now, maybe most of the seminars will give you work in advance. So it'll be the, the odd thing to show up there without anything done. Whereas in here is more, well, half and half. I'm actually very happy. You know, half the audience is actually very good, right? I've been in other seminars where I have 10%, 15%, which is still OK. My point is making you think about it, which is what I just did. All right? Good. Um, oh, by the way, uh, let me go back here. How do I know that? And that tags along the technology part, all right? Because flip classroom is, let me ask you to do this. But then I know what you're thinking. How do I make sure that my students did that, right? So technology can help you the same way they helped me here. It helped me anonymous data, all right? I just know that I got 67 clicks on the form and only 33 submissions. 
I didn't have data about who are you and what do you do, but if you're in a learning environment with an LMS, you might be able to get that detailed report, okay? All right, so in a seminar that I was uh, giving uh, at University of Sydney yesterday, I had a very good question. I thought, I'm taking this one with me. Um, like 20 minutes down the seminar, hands up, perfect. What is wrong with the conventional lecture anyway? It's like, well, that's a great question. I mean, you show up to the flipped classroom thing, maybe somebody puts you to the seminar, and it's a totally valid question. So what is wrong with that? My answer to that, nothing. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong. Or if there is something wrong, you should know. So don't ask me. You should know that. Now, my point is that, isn't it true that the type of variety of scenarios is increasing? Isn't it true that students come thinking differently, using some different techniques? Isn't it necessary for us to have more tools to address this incredibly complex scenario? So here's another tool. It's called Flip Classroom. You want to use it? Fine. You don't want to use it? Fine. It's up to you. You are the expert. You are the professional. You are the one that has to decide. All right? I think you should know about it. And you should know the limitations, the difficulties, the issues. And then as an expert, you might arrive at a situation and say, yes, Flip Classroom is the way to go. Or no, me on the podium talking. That's the most effective one. Go. Your call. All right? So I'm not pretending for you to walk out that door and say, oh, my God, yeah, I finally saw the light. I'm going to flip my classroom tomorrow. No. You have to walk out that room with another tool in your pocket. If you use it, fine. If you don't use it, fine. But, I mean, any, the analogy is first thing you do to do a very professional work is to have the right set of tools. And there is something out there that might be useful to you. That's my approach. All right. Very quickly. So. What is typically happening in a flipped classroom? Let me go first with the Bloom taxonomy, even though I have no training on education, so you'll have to forgive me or I have to apologize in advance. Any educators? Any people from the, oops, sorry. So I'm gonna wing it a little bit, right? But feel free to. So typically, the Bloom taxonomy says at the bottom we have things to remember, then to understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and finally create. And in principle, there is some increased level of cognitive load when we all go these things. Now conventionally, what we tend to do is place those two at the bottom, remember and understand in the class. We stand up there with our PowerPoint. Let me tell you, you should remember this, you should remember that. Let me make sure you understand this concept. And typically we push the other activities, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create to tutorials, homework, write an essay, uh, then are graded, and we, we engage on this exchange of information after the class or after the lecture has covered those two things, all right? Now, this has the potential to fail. I'm not saying that it fails all the time. But you should consider what if this is not cutting it? What if it doesn't work? So Flip Classroom tries to shift your mind a little bit and say, all right, we have a tendency to say, if I'm in my stage and I have a PowerPoint with 60 slides and two hours, if I reach at the end of the lecture and I cover all the material, the material was covered, 60 minutes or two hours, pat myself in the back, good lecture. That's it. All right? So maybe we should widen a little bit the concept of a successful lecture or a successful course or unit, whatever you want to call it, and think it from the point of view of the student. Was it a student success? And by student success, I don't necessarily mean that the students are happy about it, but it's more like from your professional viewpoint. Thinking about the students, was it a success? And then covering your 60 slides in two hours, uh, maybe it's not such a good idea. Maybe I have to go a little bit deeper, all right? So let me ask you this question, and we're going to give it the first go at the technology. Suppose you have to prepare a, a brand new topic, all right? Tomorrow, somebody knocks at your door, it's like, oh, guess what? Somebody has to teach this. It doesn't necessarily need to be a brand new course, but some new topic, something like, oh, I'm not totally aware of that. So you have to go off and prepare it. What I'm asking you is, okay, you have to prepare a totally new topic. Tell me, what is the most rewarding step? Learning about this new topic, again, it's not totally new for you, giving the lecture, preparing the exam, or grading this, the exam, just for the sake of completeness. All right, so what I want you to do with your computer is type this URL, Paul EV, as in Paul Everywhere, abbreviated, paulev.com, and then you have to put my full name there, so good luck with that. All right, HTTP, paulev.com, and then my full name in there. If you don't have a digital device next to you, look for somebody that has a digital device because you will be able to vote, okay? Use your device. Bring your own digital device. And again, if you don't have one next to use, no worries. Okay, you're supposed to be looking at a screen something like this. And that's where you vote. Again, once you voted, if there is somebody next to you without the device, just hand over the screen or the device and go ahead and vote. 
So now the next step is to see each other's answers in the screen right now, okay? And how is it is evolving. So we have quite a majority of you answering that the most rewarding part is actually learning about the topic, okay? Uh, some others say, no, the lecture, I enjoyed the lecture, perfect. Somebody is enjoying also grading the exam. Maybe it's the way for you to look at the content. Okay, so let's look at the results. That's it. So most of you, most of you then voted that the fun part is learning about the material, which I think I agree. But then the, the thought that I'd like you to have in your head right now is like, okay, if the most fun part for me is learning about the issue, why don't I try to capture that essence and give it to the students? Because sometimes what we do is the opposite is, I have a lot of fun preparing this thing, then I put everything in my PowerPoint and I put them to sleep. And it's like, oh, come on, you were there, you were having a lot of fun, you were in the zone while you were preparing this. Do you think you can capture that excitement and bring it to your classroom? You think you can do that because, I mean, the alternative, the death by PowerPoint, it's painful. So think about it. Again, I'm not going as far as to say that that's exactly what you should do, but the numbers over there seem to show that there is fun on what we're doing, and we might be able to convey that to students. Yes? Um, there's a philosophy called Blow It Up, and I love this from some of the YouTube lectures from the States where um, instead of taking the student gradually through the material and building up their knowledge, they actually hit them fair and square between the eyes in the very first lecture. In other words, they blow up the experiment, and then they say to the students, we're going to spend the rest of the semester figuring out why did that blow up. Yep. And so it kind of takes the student right through the journey, and then they're ready. They know where they're going. Yeah, I've seen another analogy. That's a great one. Another one is uh, drawing them a realistic scenario. Like the first day you arrive to class, rather than say, this is the course syllabus, it's more like, you are working now on this department in Antarctica that needs to study about this bug that is killing the... And they go like, what is going on here? Well, that's a realistic scenario. And then I'm going to connect all my material there. So that's a very good technique. I think it's very effective. I, I do it in my course exactly as you said, the first day. Yeah. You know, to set the stage and say, we are serious here. The one that I use, I'm teaching engineering. And the one that I'm using is you work for a company and they have to decide a new phone to use in the company. Which model would you choose? Oh, I don't know. Well, all right. Let's talk about the, the phones, the circuits, the digital logic, all these concepts then tag along these things. So this is another very powerful argument. Um, it's going to appear in my slides with the name of the narrative. You need a narrative because the narrative gives you a very good um, scaffolding to grab yourself when you're doing this flip class. So you're flipping, but it's okay if you have a, a hand on your scaffolding, and that scaffolding could be the narrative, have this called a narrative. All right, so this is our first hand at you participating. Hopefully, I managed to get all of you participating in the lecture or in the class, which is another of the objectives, and this is something I think you should aim, up, aim at when you deploy your, uh, your um, lecture or your session. So what did we do here? The other way around now. Remembering, understanding, and applying, this is something we pushed to the beginning before even the lecture. Let's give them material to think about it, to read about it, uh, to try to understand it. Uh, I'm not saying this is easy, but it's the alternative. This is the alternative to the conventional classroom. And then we use the face-to-face -face time, the valuable face-to-face -face time for evaluation, for analysis, for creation. Okay? And as you can see, we're still trying to cover these different levels of the Bloom taxonomy. We're just doing it in a different way. And again, you might think this doesn't make any sense, or you might think, well, yeah, it makes a little bit of sense, because the difficulties typically are up there creating. When you ask your students, please create a discussion of, or tell me what is your opinion about these different two uh, topics you see in this paper. Uh, mm, um, I don't know. Is this going to be in the exam? How are you going to ask for this? Can, can I have a sample? All right, you're struggling with that. So maybe that's the face-to-face -face time we have to devote to. All right, so does it work? Um, and I'm reaching here for some evidence. All right, before going into this, I'm sure somebody did this before. Does it work? And the answer is very predictable sometimes. This is a complex thing. It has so many ingredients that it depends on how you do it. It'll work or it won't work. The important thing is that you already find in the literature papers out there that said, I tried the flip classroom and it doesn't work. And this paper that I'm mentioning there, by the way, the references are all the way at the bottom of the slides, so you can have access to them. That paper that says no, it doesn't work, what it says is that not as expected in the sense that students um, appreciated the interaction, the discussion, the different points of view. So the interactivity of the class, the students appreciated that. 
Maybe I didn't achieve my objectives, my learning objectives, and I have to review my strategy, but still I gained something. And then there are articles that say, yeah, there is a significant increase, one of them in chemistry, another one in, I have a, one of the resources that I gave you, um, very interesting one that explains all the difficulties about ancient Rome history, which is also, so you find all sorts of opinions, which is, I think, okay, we can live with that. So the answer to you, should I try this or not? Well, somebody did it successfully, so we might give it a try. You also see a lot of, uh, opposite uh, opinions in the newspapers. This one is from the Chronicle of Higher Education saying, oh, how flipping the lecture is going to improve your, your uh, overall performance in the course, or the students. And they go on and say, because the students get much more engaged, and it works. But then you have these other opinions that say, you know, this flipped classroom is basically a scam. Because now I have a lot of videos out there. My instructor is not doing the work he's supposed to be doing. And I'm going to the lectures, they're still lame, so what is going on here? And if I'm paying a lot of money, and there's been some cases of people being very vocal about that. And I think it's a, also a valid point that we should take into account. All right, let's uh, play a little bit and explore how I, we can do something like this. I would like you to focus on the essence. So if I want to get my students engaged in an activity of a higher cognitive level, how do I do that? But before doing that, I'm going to use a technique that um, it's called the six hats, the bono six hat technique, simplified to two hats only. We're going to do two stages. I know some of you are a bit skeptical, reluctant, all of you, and, and somebody already told me, like, I was reading this, and then I thought, well, let me think about this, let me think about it. All right, so my counterattack for that is, let's hash out first the reasons to be skeptical. Let's think about the negative parts of flip classroom. The reason why I want you to do that is because if we do it all at the same time, then we get it all out of the picture. Okay? So, yeah, three, four, five minutes. Let's get out there and write, and this is the other thing I have to tell you. Again, we go to the same URL. Okay? So, obstacles, difficulties. Let's go on with that. Go to the same URL and think about a concept, a tag, something that really tells you what are the difficulties, what are the... Obstacles, what is, this is a fraud, all right, it's a fraud, or I don't want to say any of this because that'll probably um, influence you. So right there, what is the negative aspect that I'm seeing already from the flipped classroom? Let's share that, and, and the label should appear now in the screen. I think we already have one, two, three. Okay, it might be a fad, good. Ooh, students come good. <laughs> Might be boring. Okay, here we have some examples of what we just said, or what you just said. How do you know students have the confidence and motivation to do the preparatory work? Excellent point. So it is about the students, so I'm, I'm really glad to see the students appearing up there. Actually, the other word tag, students was huge. So the, the gravitation towards the student is already happening, which is great. So we're going to look at, at everything from the eyes of the student. Other issues, large class sizes, and that's precisely the reason why I included one reference on that previous material about can I flip a large class? Go look at it. You can do it. Or it is being done, okay, at least. Uh, other things, lack of a student preparation. Indeed, we had 50% of you that didn't look at the previous resources, so something must be done about that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, need to, I needed to come back to that. <laughs> Couldn't help it. Access to technology, definitely an issue. And if you go deeper, a little bit deeper, the good news is that flipped classroom with a little bit of time and patience is generous in terms of the amount of technology you use. All right? I'll show you some pictures of how you can replace technology or kind of reduce a little bit the dependency on technology. More work for the student, yes. And as a consequence, there will be a pushback. And that's another thing that a lot of people suffer, you know, like, all right, finally, you convince me. I'm going to do the flip classroom. Then you do it, and then students come back to you and say, what? We're totally mad at you. It's like, oh, so let me see if I understand. I had all my students happy with my lectures before. Now I flip the class to make it better, and they all get mad at me. So people are like, what's going on? I mean, I've been ripped off. What is this? All right, there is pushback. Why? Well, my view or my personal opinion is that the way we teach right now, up in the podium with a five-year-old PowerPoint slide, it's a state of minimum energy for everybody, for the students and for the lecturer. Now, when you move out of a uh, state of minimum energy, you need energy. So is it going to be more? Yes, it is going to be more. Is it going to take more? Yes, it is going to take more. So there's no such thing as a free lunch, OK? You just have to be aware of that. 
And then, again, your call. You're the professional. Some other interesting things that are popping up. Um, a student having different learning styles. And that's an issue that no matter which strategy you put out there, you're going to struggle with. All right? You have to be aware of that. With flipped classroom, can you cope with that? Well, there are a lot of or or orthogonal techniques you put on top of that. So if you're going to discuss, then maybe the type of discussion we can shape it such that it, it lends itself better to your learning style. If there is the person that has a learning style doesn't want to exchange anything with anybody, maybe we can put you in a different type of activity. But that's something that goes across any, any uh, pedagogical strategy you have out there. Uh, other things. Student dissatisfaction, I already anticipated that. Students not participating, something lack of engagement. Uh, time, time I guess, person that wrote time. Whose time? Students' time, yeah, they need time for that. And we have to make a much better job at estimating the duration of the activity. And then I go back to your initial comment. I should have told you how much time do you need for your activity because I'm asking you, please go through here. Trust me, I measured this and it's gonna take you half an hour. But also the time for us to prepare those courses because they are more intensive. And this gives me back to the resources question. So we have a lot of difficulties out there, all right? Um, this screen is only showing, showing a subset. Is there anybody that wrote something there that feels that it should be seen that is not being shown on the screen? Any other issue? Yes? Um, I think a lot of staff want to do it. It's just not having a knowledge of alternate teaching and learning strategies. Because if they're not an educator, then they're a professional in their, their spectrum, they may not have that, that other Totally valid point. My answer to that is the following. What do you do in research? You are an expert, right, in research, in your area. But you know how research works. The area moves a little bit. So two, three years later, it's like this new topic that is close to what you do. And it's like, oh. And typically, we leap. We go. I need to enter that area. So th all through our, our careers in research, we have to take that leap. Or when it comes uh, uh, grant writing proposal time, Huh? You have to write the grant. You don't go about what you know. It's like more like out there, right? So we do that in research. Why don't we do that in teaching? Because I don't have training in uh, teaching. That's okay, but uh, still, you can do something about it. So the typical resistance is more like I'm not fully prepared. Okay, yeah, but you still can manage. You still can do something gradual. Okay, we're going to go also through the steps, the strategy. You can go very gradual. So the worst thing you could do is flip the entire course for tomorrow. But you can flip a couple of activities, or one module, or one topic, and see how it goes, and see how it feels. All right. So this is an incredibly valid point. And when we talk to staff, it comes back all the time. I'm, I don't think I'm ready. But then you look around, and some others, they just go. They just go and try it. And again, there will be mishaps. There will be adjustments. But again, that's, I think that's your job, to see, OK, it didn't go as well as it should. Or for my next seminar, I'll make sure I'll include the duration of that task, because I got that feedback. All right, so it's an improvement. So it's a little bit of just go, just jump, but slowly with a small activity or a small module. Yes. Yes. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. I'm here in the middle of the room. All of you are looking at me, right? But then we go into this voting thing, and the whole thing is a mess. So I lost control of the room. And that's exactly the point. How am I feeling? OK. Because that's when I know you're having this interesting discussion. By looking at me, it might be interesting, but not as much as the discussion you have. So I, I need to allow you to get on your tables and discussion and big rumor. And then, then I have to regain control for a little bit to discuss another thing. And then we go again. So, you have to get used to that, definitely. Yeah, and it's a big thing. One of the points that I'm going to make to the uh, towards the end, I, I summarize that at the change of your roles, but not of, of your roles, but the student roles have to change too, and that's the resistance as well. So you have to feel comfortable having these 300 students in a room in a theater and say, "Let's discuss this." And for five minutes, you cannot hear your own voice, right? Goes, and then finally, you bring them in again. And say, so what was the conclusion? But it can be done. It can be done. There are techniques for that. That's an excellent point. Any other thing? All right, let's see. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. 
in my view, um, I, I experienced that because I tend to organize groups in my, in my courses. And one of the things that surprised me when I look up literature for conflict management and, and group dysfunction, there is lots of papers out there. And what I was surprised is that they categorize in three or four different type of anomalies. That, that covers 90% of what happens, you know? You tell them, let's work in a group. So you have one category that is one of the members saying, step aside, I know what to do. I'm the leader, the locomotive, all of you shut up, I'll do it. And it's like, yeah, that happens. Then the other one is the, the polarized subgroups, like the two of us, we're not talking the two of you because, you know, we don't feel like it. All right, so, and you can address those things. So it's not a complete solution, but there are tools also out there that allow you to tackle these things. So what I've done in some of my courses is I ask the students, would you think you have a conflict in your team? And if you have a conflict, tell me, which one of these it is? And you'll be surprised how accurate they tell you. We have the locomotive here. <laughs> And let me ask you this question to you. If you look at the teams, would you be able to spot that person? 15 seconds will take. You sit next to them. You just see how they interact. Exactly. But one of the things that usually works is you address these issues beforehand. So you're going to work in a team. You're going to have problems. And it's going to be one of those five problems. So again, you're not going to be with all your teams, but you're passing the responsibility a little bit to them. Yes? And you run that risk, in fact, yeah. If you only flip like five minutes of your lecture, the, the students might look at you and say, so what was that, right? So you need to measure also to say, okay, if I want for them to discuss something, how much material do I get in beforehand? And if this is the first time I do it in the middle of the semester, how I uh, reduce or alleviate this new effect is like, oh, really? Do I have to watch a video now before coming to class? This, this didn't used to happen before. And we know students, they are very... Uh, they, they want predictability, right? If you, every week you show up with your PowerPoint slides, uh, if you're going to make a change, you have to be aware of that because it's a system. I like that, that observation a lot. All right. Yes? Just one more question. If you're an academic doing this, but you've got three other academics with three other courses, what then, and the ones have more traditional, you do the flipped, how does the student manage? That's a very good question. So you have three identical courses, um, section A, section B, section C, section A flips, and the other ones stay. There is no easy way around that. There is no easy way around that. And it might be a dead end if you have to then converge to the same final exam. And then it's like, ooh, but I cover different things in different ways. And even course, like you have four courses in a semester, and then suddenly one's doing flipped, the other three is staying. But again, my suggestion would be uh, try to avoid thinking as a complete transformation. And maybe there are a couple of topics that the students struggle with, and guess what? You flip, and then you see the results, and if it works, then you go back and say, like, this is why I flipped. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you just go back to what you were doing before. All right? All right, we need to move on. I think there was another comment. Yeah, there was, yeah. Um, an important one for me. I think as an academic, my biggest fear was always that I would go into the classroom and there would be no students there. <laughs> or even worse, there would be a lot of students So the fear of uh, students not showing up or not attending is because th there is not much value on your lecture. It's as simple as that. If I miss your lecture, nothing happens. Or if I go there, it's like, oh, yeah, this is the same PowerPoint. I'm working out. So you have to provide lecture. Uh, sorry, you have to provide value to your lecture. Now, suppose you do a very interesting discussion, interaction, and the type of questions that you put there, you just happen to mention that that's the type of questions you're going to put in the exam. So automatically, Nine out of nine students will tell, oh, there is value here. I shouldn't go away. All right? Let me give you another example. People ask me all the time, the students, are you going to record the class? Yeah, sure, I'll record it. But half of the class will be me silent because I, I wear a mic like this one. So if we, were, if we are recording that, actually, that just came to me. <laughs> all your comments are not being picked up. So hello, those of you looking at the video. You missed the important part, which was the discussion. 
because there is value of us as being here. Okay? I have another sentence towards the end. Um, if you are scared that you might be replaced by a video, perhaps you should. <laughs> I also find another article, it's easy to spot, um, how to make your lecture unmissable. So some techniques. Do something that students say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I have this lecture. I have to go. I have to go. Why? Because I have to be there. Because if the only thing you are providing is the five-year-old PowerPoint, again, there is that version already there circulating because some students posted from last year, and three or four corrections and three or four versions much better from another university. So it's up to you. Your call again. All right, let's move on. Now, we've hashed out all the negative feelings. Now let's focus on the positive ones. Again, potential benefits, um, the happy stuff, the, oh, yeah, this is going to, you know, the shorter the concept, the better, all right? Feel free to write whatever you want, but if you choose a word or a couple of words, it'll help to cram more on the screen. But again, you have total freedom. So we'll probably encourage engagement. Okay, lots of good ideas coming up. Better learning. So there is potential for better learning. Okay, here we have some examples of what we just said, or what you just said. How do you know students have the confidence and motivation to do the preparatory work? Excellent point. So it is about the students. So I'm, I'm really glad to see the students appearing up there. Actually, the other word tag, students was huge. So the, the gravitation towards the student is already happening, which is great. So we're going to look at, at everything from the eyes of the student. Other issues, large class sizes, and that's precisely the reason why I included one reference on that previous material about can I flip a large class? Go look at it. You can do it. Or it is been done, okay, at least. Uh, other things, lack of a student preparation. Indeed, we had 50% of you that didn't look at the previous resources, so something must be done about that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, need to, I needed to come back to that. <laughs> Couldn't help it. Access to technology, definitely an issue. And if you go deeper, a little bit deeper, the good news is that flipped classroom with a little bit of time and patience is generous in terms of the amount of technology you use, all right? I'll show you some pictures of how you can replace technology or kind of reduce a little bit the dependency on technology. More work for the student, yes. And as a consequence, there will be a pushback. And that's another thing that a lot of people suffer. You know, like, all right, finally, you convince me. I'm going to do the flipped classroom. Then you do it, and then students come back to you and say, what? We're totally mad at you. It's like, oh, so let me see if I understand. I had all my students happy with my lectures before. Now I flipped the class to make it better, and they all get mad at me. So people are like, what's going on? I mean... I've been ripped off. What is this? All right, there is pushback. Why? Well, my view or my personal opinion is that the way we teach right now, up in the podium with a five-year-old PowerPoint slide, it's a state of minimum energy for everybody, for the students and for the lecturer. Now, when you move out of a uh, state of minimum energy, you need energy. So is it going to be more? Yes, it is going to be more. Is it going to take more? Yes, it is going to take more. So there's no such thing as a free lunch, okay? You just have to be aware of that. And then, again, your call. You're the professional. Some other interesting things that are popping up. Um, a student having different learning styles. And that's an issue that no matter which strategy you put out there, you're going to struggle with. All right? You have to be aware of that. With flipped classroom, can you cope with that? Well, there are a lot of or or orthogonal techniques you put on top of that. So if you're going to discuss, then maybe the type of discussion we can shape it such that it, it lends itself better to your learning style. If there is the person that has a learning style, doesn't want to exchange anything with anybody, maybe we can put you in a different type of activity. But that's something that goes across any, any uh, pedagogical strategy you have out there. Uh, other things, student dissatisfaction. I already anticipated that. Students not participating, something lack of engagement. Uh, time. Time, I guess, person that wrote time, whose time? Students' time, yeah, they need time for that. And we have to make a much better job at estimating the duration of the activity. And then I go back to your initial comment. I should have told you how much time do you need for your activity, because I'm asking you, please go through here. Trust me, I measured this, and it's going to take you half an hour. But also the time for us to prepare those courses, because they are more intensive. And this gives me back to the resources question. So we have a lot of difficulties out there. All right? Um, this screen is only showing, showing a subset. Is there anybody that wrote something there that feels that it should be seen that is not being shown on the screen? Any other issue? Yes? Um, I think a lot of staff want to do it. It's just not having a knowledge of alternate teaching and learning strategies. Because if they're not an educator, they are professional in their, their spectrum, they may not have that, that other knowledge. Totally valid point. 
My answer to that is the following. What do you do in research? You are an expert, right, in research, in your area. But you know how research works. The area moves a little bit. So two, three years later, it's like this new topic that is close to what you do, and it's like, oh, and typically we leap, we go. I need to enter that area. So th all through our, our careers in research, we have to take that leap. Or when it comes uh, uh, grant writing proposal time, huh? you have to write the grant. You don't go about what you know. It's like more like out there, right? So we do that in research. Why don't we do that in teaching? Because I don't have training in uh, teaching. That's OK, but uh, still, you can do something about it. So the typical resistance is more like, I'm not fully prepared. OK, yeah, but you still can manage. You still can do something gradual. OK, we're going to go also through the steps, the strategy. You can go very gradual. So the worst thing you could do is flip the entire course for tomorrow. But you can flip a couple of activities, or one module, or one topic, and see how it goes, and see how it feels. All right. So this is an incredibly valid point. And when we talk to staff, it comes back all the time. I'm, I don't think I'm ready. But then you look around, and some others, they just go. They just go and try it. And again, there will be mishaps, there will be adjustments. But again, that's, I think that's your job, to see, OK, it didn't go as well as it should. Or for my next seminar, I'll make sure I'll include the duration of that task, because I got that feedback. All right? So it's an improvement. So it's a little bit of just go, just jump, but slowly with a small activity or a small module. Yes? Yes. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. I'm here in the middle of the room. All of you are looking at me, right? But then we go into this voting thing, and the whole thing is a mess. So I lost control of the room. And that's exactly the point. How am I feeling? OK. Because that's when I know you're having this interesting discussion. By looking at me, it might be interesting, but not as much as the discussion you have. So I, I need to allow you to get on your tables and discussion and big rumor. And then, then I have to regain control for a little bit to discuss another thing. And then we go again. So you have to get used to that, definitely. Yeah. And it's a big thing. One of the points that I'm going to make to the, uh, towards the end, I, I summarize that at the change of your roles. But not of, of your roles, but the student roles have to change too. And that's the resistance as well. So you have to feel comfortable having these 300 students in a room in a theater and say, let's discuss this. And for five minutes, you cannot hear your own voice, right? <laughs> And then finally, you bring them in again and say, so what was the conclusion? But it can be done. It can be done. There are techniques for that. That's an excellent point. Any other thing? All right. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. In my view, um, I, I experienced that because I tend to organize groups in my, in my courses. And one of the things that surprised me when I look up literature for conflict management and, and group dysfunction, there is lots of papers out there. And what I was surprised is that they categorize in three or four different type of anomalies. That, that covers 90% of what happens. You, know? you tell them, let's work in a group. So you have one category that is one of the members saying, step aside, I know what to do. I'm the leader, the locomotive, all of you shut up, I'll do it. And it's like, yeah, that happens. Then the other one is the, the polarized subgroups, like the two of us, we're not talking the two of you because you know, we don't feel like. All right, so, and you can address those things. So it's not a complete solution, but there are tools also out there that allow you to tackle these things. So what I've done in some of my courses is I ask the students, would you think you have a conflict in your team? And if you have a conflict, tell me which one of these it is. And you'll be surprised how accurate they tell you. We have the locomotive here. <laughs> And let me ask you this question to you. If you look at the teams, would you be able to spot that person? 15 seconds will take. You sit next to them. You just see how they interact. Exactly. But one of the things that usually works is you address these issues beforehand. So you're going to work in a team. You're going to have problems. And it's going to be one of those five problems. So again, you're not going to be with all your teams. But you're passing the responsibility a little bit to them. Yes?
opportunities to work in, in teams anyway and breaking the ice so that you don't get that thing. But I think just in doing one thing can sometimes be more tricky than not considering how it impacts on other things and supporting. So I'd see flipped classrooms as being supported by everything that you do in your tutorial. Yeah, and you run that risk, in fact, yeah. If you only flip like five minutes of your lecture, the, the students might look at you and say, so what was that, right? So you need to measure also to say, okay, if I want for them to discuss something, how much material do I get in beforehand? And if this is the first time I do it in the middle of the semester, how I uh, reduce or alleviate this new effect is like, oh, really? Do I have to watch a video now before coming to class? This, this didn't used to happen before. And we know students, they are very, uh, they, they want predictability, right? If you, every week you show up with your PowerPoint slides, uh, if you're going to make a change, you have to be aware of that because it's a system. I like that, that observation a lot. All right, yes. That's a very good question. So you have three identical courses, um, section A, section B, section C, and section A flips, and the other ones stay. There is no easy way around that. There is no easy way around that. And it might be a dead end if you have to then converge to the same final exam. And then it's like, ooh, but I cover different things in different ways. And even course, like you have four courses in a semester, and then suddenly one's doing flipped, the other three is staying. But again, my suggestion would be uh, try to avoid thinking as a complete transformation. And maybe there are a couple of topics that the students struggle with. And guess what? You flip, and then you see the results. And if it works, then you go back and say, like, this is why I flipped. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you just go back to what you were doing before. All right? All right, we need to move on. I think there was another comment. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Um, an important one for me. I think as an academic, my biggest fear was always that I'm going to the classroom and there would be no students there. <laughs> or even worse, there would be a lot of students there, but halfway through they would walk out. <laughs> I have recently not been involved, but have seen both of those scenarios. And you mentioned risk. Um, we're all involved in the risk industry. Um, why should we do this? Um, and what do we do about that fear? So the fear of... Uh students not showing up or not attending is because th there's not much value on your lecture. It's as simple as that. If I miss your lecture, nothing happens. Or if I go there, it's like, oh, yeah, this is the same PowerPoint. I'm working out. So you have to provide lecture. Uh, sorry, you have to provide value to your lecture. Now, suppose you do a very interesting discussion, interaction, and the type of questions that you put there, you just happen to mention that that's the type of questions you're going to put in the exam. So automatically, nine out of nine students will tell, oh, there is value here. I shouldn't go away, all right? Let me give you another example. People ask me all the time, the students, are you going to record the class? Yeah, sure, I'll record it. But half of the class will be me silent because I, I wear a mic like this one. So if we, were, if we are recording that, actually, that just came to me. <laughs> all your comments are not being picked up. So hello, those of you looking at the video. You missed the important part, which was the discussion. Because <laughs> there is value of us, us being here, OK? I have another sentence towards the end. Um, if you are scared that you might be replaced by a video, perhaps you should. <laughs> I also find another article, it's easy to spot, um, how to make your lecture unmissable. So some techniques. Do something that a student say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I have this lecture, I have to go, I have to go. Why? Because I have to be there. Because if the only thing you are providing is the five-year-old PowerPoint, again, there is that version already there circulating because some students posted from last year and three or four corrections and three or four versions much better from another university. So it's up to you, your call again. All right, let's move on. Now, we've hashed out all the negative feelings. Now let's focus on the positive ones. Again, let's vote, same scheme, same URL. Potential benefits, um, the happy stuff, the oh yeah, this is going to, you know, the shorter the concept, the better, all right? Feel free to write whatever you want, but if you choose a word or a couple of words, it'll help to cram more on the screen. But again, you have total freedom. So we'll probably encourage engagement. Interactive enough? Oh, fantastic. All right. All right. Okay, lots of good ideas coming up. Better learning. So there is potential for better learning. 
One of them I'm really happy that appear and appears all the time, or almost all the time, is there is potential for fun. So I can, it could be fun, all right? Uh, other things that appear very strongly, engagement, uh, improved results. So that's right there, it's worth trying to see if it is true. Um, you enjoy, you add value, retention, that's also a very important point, retention. And the reason why I think this is important is this is an issue that, in my experience, upper management has no problem to connect that to the bottom line. And that gets things moving, all right? So if you go, there's like, I like to improve my teachings. Like, yeah, sure, go ahead. I like to, you know, improve the revenue and you connect it with the bottom line. Like it or not, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we should go about that. And yeah, retention is very important, you know, because it's, I mean, it's upper management. What do you want? Um, it's interactive. Um, some, somebody typed fish, which is interesting. <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having problems connecting that, but I'm sure there is a concept that uh, connecting that. Fish philosophy. Fish philosophy? Which is, comes from the Seattle fish markets, which is about um, choose your attitude, um, be, be there, whatever you're doing, get fully immersed. Um, um, sort of make their day. So okay, okay, with excellent. Making it great for them and have fun. Make perfect sense then. It captures a lot of the essence of, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. perfect. But it's also uh, giving transferable skills beyond graduation. Uh, so, you know, you teach someone to fish, they'll just be able to use And this is very important. Yeah, when you get your students discussing like this, you can take a couple of minutes and say, by the way, when you pass your job interview and they hire you, They'll sit you in a table to do these discussions with your team. So better get used to it. Better get used to make your point across. Better get used to listen to other people. Even though we're talking about, you know, ancient Rome history, but now you also squeeze these skills. I like it. Love it. All right. Excellent. All right. So let's, let's play around a little bit with some concrete examples. So, all right. So flip classroom, we know what is wrong. We know what it could be right. Let's put a small example. So what are we looking for? We're looking for these nuggets, these engagement with them, posing them a problem, posing them a question, this is spark. It's like, oh, I have to solve this. So this is an example. Um, the reason why I chose, well, first of all, I should ask, is there a math mathematician in the room? <laughs> you again? All right, so bear with me, bear with me, okay? <laughs> so the reason why I chose this topic is because I was told that there might be almost very low numbers of mathematics. So I basically choose a topic that it's foreign to, all, to most of you. And yet, we can play around with it, all right? Um, these are the typical puzzles you find anywhere. Now, why are these puzzles sometimes so engaging? Because they put you on the spot immediately. And for this session, it's very handy because you don't require much of a pre previous knowledge. So I don't need to ask you for previous activities to understand what is going on there. So the problem is there are two cities that are different distance from the river, and you have to uh, build a uh, um, pumping station. And the cost is the length of the pipes to connect from the pump station to the two cities. Where would you put the pump station? And of course, the optimization criteria here is that you have to save money. So you won't put it out there because then you have to deploy the two pipes for the two cities. So where would you put it? Would you put it in the middle? Okay, so I want you to capture the essence of this moment. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, there's a problem and I have to solve it. And it sparks you the need to, let's see what's going on here. For those of you closer to mathematics, uh, it's an optimization problem. You can state in terms of the three constants you see there, the distance of two, the two cities uh, to the river and the distance between the two cities. So these are three constants, A, B, and C. And there is two ways to solve this. But that's irrelevant. What I want you to capture is you have given, you've been given a challenge. You know exactly what you have to solve. You probably don't have a lot of a good idea right now how to solve it. But that is the type of energy that you want to capture. All right? This is a very simplified example because you don't need any prior knowledge. It's like, boom, there it is. But if I give you some prior knowledge, then we can walk up the ladder and do something a bit more sophisticated, uh, some example that is a bit more sophisticated. This is not trivial, though, because once you, the two ways that I come up with uh, to solve this problem is that you write an equation, you write basically a function telling you the length of the two pipes, and then that function, you find the minimum. And you move the variable of that function is the distance of the pumping station. Although, there is another way, incredibly clever to solve this, geometrically, which is you flip, ironically, one of the city to the other side of the river, you put a line, and whatever that line crosses the river, that's the exact point which will give you the minimum amount of pipes. 
Okay? But again, the solution is irrelevant. The process is what counts. So what I, want, what I want you to capture is how I can come up with these scenarios that when I provide it to the students, they go like, oh, wait. Um, or if you make them vote, you have like half and half. Half of them say yes, the other half say no. Ideal, we have a controversy here. We'll discuss, well, let's talk about it. And on top of that, you have to put previous knowledge. Let me give you another example. So the ingredients uh, of a good question, or a, or a good, I call it question for lack of a better term, but it could be an activity, or these nuggets that we need to use to spark the students. So not only we are asking them to remember and understand, but the crucial thing is that we're asking them to apply, analyze, and create. They have to create some sort of model of that problem. They have to analyze what is going on with the pipes, what is the cost. They have to think about those issues which are up there in the Bloom taxonomy, not so much remembering the... Another one, this is an interesting one, another one from Mass. Um, the topics, well, I didn't mention before, let me go back. I chose a topic. So if we put this in a math, math context, the topic would be, let's talk about function minimization. But the objective is I want you to find a minimum of a function. So you need to, these two ingredients, you need to state what is the topic we're talking about, but then what am I after? I'm after in you understanding how to minimize, how to find the minimum of a function. These other example, the topic, continuous functions. Again, math, you don't need to understand exactly what is going on. Objective, let's deduce new properties from functions. This is an interesting one. Two opposite points in the equator always simultaneously have the same temperature. Always. At all times. And this is a very beautiful result because it's counterintuitive. It's like, really? I mean, opposite points and they're always at the same temperature? I'm not saying they're always the same point, but at some point, at any instant in time, there are two points opposite in the equator. They have exactly the same temperature. So again, that puts you in that odd spot. Like, I don't, like, that might not be correct. Or, is it correct or not? All right, so this is the essence of what we're after. When the students feel that, it's like, I need, I need to know that now. Is this true or not? Okay, I'm not saying that this uh, will work for everybody, but I'm giving you a few examples just to, for you to capture and, and start making this exercise, which I'm seeing some of you already doing. It's like, okay, so in my course, what would be the equivalent of the equator problem? Um, if you read literature about these type of things, the physics, any physics, professor here in the room, physics play with advantage, with a lot of advantage. Why? Because when you put these things, you always have reality around you to show you the answer. And sometimes the answer is contradictory. So it's like, I, I throw this thing from here and I throw something that is much heavier from the same height. Will they hit the, the floor at the same time or not? Some will say, yeah, no, because one is bigger. Well, you just go and try it, all right? So physics, there are lots of examples about physics. And this is because they have a very good way of checking things, right? So we have to work a little bit harder. And we, if we're teaching ancient Rome history, uh, we might not have these paradoxes or uh, resources. But still, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. We just need to work a little bit harder. That's all, all right? Um, so this is an example in which you make, a, an, again, a mathematical function that measures the temperature. Now the equator is a circle. So when you start and when you finish, you have exactly the same value. So the function does something in between. And there is a theory that says if the function is down here and then up here and it is continuous, at some point it needs to cross the barrier. So the solution is just you reframe this problem saying the temperature or the difference between temperatures in these two points at some point has to be zero. And it is. And you prove it. There is a theorem that tells you, oh, yeah, it's going to be zero. So you, you deduct it that at all times there are two points in the equator are always with the same temperature, exactly the same temperature. All right. Another example. Let's push the boundaries here. This is a topic you are not familiar with. Now, I'm going to push the boundaries because I'm going to give you previous information, and then I'm going to ask you a question. All right? So next step, we're getting closer to the real scenario, which is I'm giving the students previous activities, and then I ask them about that. So the previous activity is, all right, let's try to figure out how does this thing work. So this is like a room or an apparatus or a system. I, I made it abstract on purpose. And it works the following way. It has one input, or actually two inputs, one on the side, another on the bottom. And it's like as if somebody was there with a light, and it's a red or a green light. And then it has two outputs. Light one always becomes the same color as the entrance, and light two is the opposite. Okay? So one contradicts the other. But, but the lights at the outside, the lights light one and light two, only follow or reflect or transmit the color at the entrance when there is an event that says now. So they only pay attention to that light when the arrow at the bottom says now, any other time, the light in there is ignored. OK? All right. This is the previous information. So I basically, you're faced with a system. 
and I'm trying to give you information to understand. And I could capture this in a video very easily. Right? You're not doing anything other than listening to me. All right, so here comes the question. Now, what I do is I connect light two with the entry light. I make a loop. All right? So it's connected like that. Then I ask you, what is the value of light one after several events now occur? So you basically have this connection, and then you go like, now, 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 now. What happened with light one? Is it red? Is it green? Discuss. Let's stop for a second, and let's make a quick vote. Let's vote very, very quickly. Now, when we vote, I want you to do one thing. I want you to look around to see who votes what, all right? So no technology right now. Raise your hand, those of you that think that A is correct. In other words, it stays constantly with the same color, A. Hands up. Now, what I want you to see is where is the discrepancy with your answer, all right? So you voted A. The other ones look, okay, they voted A. Hands up for those that think that the answer is B. Every now event, the light changed the color. A few of you. All right. Hands up for C. All right. So you'll have to find some reason why everybody else is voting otherwise, right? Answer D. I don't know. <laughs> Good. All right. So now you have seen that if you voted D and you don't know, somebody around you knows. Maybe knows the wrong answer, but they know. <laughs> All right? So here's stage number two. You kind of face the problem. Actually, I should have done it with you in silence, but that's okay. All right? So we, you face the problem. You think you can get a hold of it. Then hands up. Then you look around. It's like, oh, so let's discuss again. Now find the person next to you. Say, oh, you really think so? Why? Let's discuss, and then let's vote again. Let's go. Another minute <laughs> to discuss and to find some consensus. All right, let's vote again. Very quickly, I want to see a show of hands. Those of you that think still A is the correct answer. Hands up, A. So you see we have some changes there. Are you still convinced, A? All right, good. Hands up for those of you who think it's B. All right. Hands up for those of you that C. No, 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 somebody else. Look at this. A lot of change here, okay? Who convinced you of that? Nobody voted C. <laughs> no, no, no finger pointing, no finger pointing. And those of you still in D? All right, that's okay. So, I know you want to know which one it is, but before we do that, okay, before we do that, anticipation generates value. Think about that. <laughs> anticipation generates value. I'm not telling you now, I'm telling you for you to use in your courses. Generate anticipation. By the way, I didn't invent that. You go out there and marketing knows about that. Anticipation creates value. So I want you to reflect on what just happened here. So you go off and try to figure out that thing. It's new to you, very important. You're giving certain information. But then you create this sense of like, did I get it right or not? Well, let's vote. And then you see around you that there is some sort of like, hmm, let's discuss about that. You're investing time. You're investing your, hmm, I, I think I'm right. So I have to convince the other ones. Or I'm not sure if I'm right, so let me ask. So you might be accommodating different learning styles there, OK? Or there might be the quiet person there, but you still ask because that quiet person is the one that voted the option that you think it might be right, and yours is wrong. Hmm, what's going on here? So there is a lot of things happening just on this procedure. And then, of course, you need to know if you're right or wrong, OK? Now, I want you also to think about it. We cannot do this exercise with the technology I was just using. Because the technology I was just using, yeah, it was very fancy. But you don't see around who's voting. You don't see who is disagreeing with you. you. See, This is an example of technology. As long as it works to your advantage, fine. But again, it's another tool. Maybe it's a time to toss the tool, forget about the technology, hands up. All right. Another issue that comes from hands up, I teach first year students. If something happens and you are the only one raising your hand with an option, for a first year student, that could be a big issue. We all laugh, but it's serious. It's serious. So you have to gauge those things, right? So my point of view, when I go to class, I carry a few of these. And when I see that the answers are totally polarized on one side, I didn't do my work properly. That's not a good question. A good question is when I get a lot of spread. Because people will begin to think, like, how can it be? I mean, 
we don't have a consensus here. All right. So to reach a consensus, you need to know the right answer. And to, need to, and to know the right answer, you need to know the details on how that thing works, which is what I'm after. So I tricked you. I want you to get the essence, because this is what you have to apply in your courses. All right? Very challenging coming up with these things. I sometimes pretend that I'm a, like a, one of these singers. When they interview the singers, like, this is a very, um, very famous album, right? It was very popular. What was your favorite song? It's like, well, guess what? We put six songs on that album, and we thought that like, the most popular one was this one. Then you put it on the street, and that other song that we put on that album, we thought, eh. It goes totally viral, and it's the greatest one. So this is something like that. I carry my nine questions or six questions to class, and these are great, you know? Three of them flop miserably. Two of them go on and on. And the one that I had in the last minute thinking, this is going to be a disaster, pops. And it says, oh, this is great. So you go back with your notes, saying, all right, polish this one, dump these other two, and let's see if we can replicate this one five times. OK? So this is part of the game. So what happens here? Another thing that I should warn you. My explanation might not sound convincing. <laughs> you might say, you tricked me because you didn't tell me about this. And I can take all that, no problem. But you'll remember it. OK? So the solution for this. Um, so the way it works is you have a light here. And when it, this one says, now, this light becomes the same color as this one, right? So um, if this thing stays quiet, and I flick the light, red, green, red, green, red, green. What does it happen here? Nothing. Nothing happens, right? So this is kind of like a guardian. So when I say so, is when this thing becomes this. All right. So suppose I have a red light. So what do I have here to begin with? I didn't tell you. That's an important thing, right? Or not, because what you can say is like, every now event changes color. But I don't say which color. So it's, it's still compatible with B. I didn't tell you it changes from red to green initially. So when I get the now, the light that I have here, if it's red, this one becomes red, and this one becomes green. And this green has to travel and come here again. So it's knocking at the door again. It used to be red, but now it's green, obviously, because this is going to be the opposite of this, right? So this red propagates here. This becomes green, but you have to travel all the way back here. So it's like, hey, I'm green. Yeah, but it's not now. So you stay green. OK? So you got a red here. But you have a green at the door because it's the opposite. Then it comes now again. OK, so the green goes here. And it's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I should go to red. Yeah, but you go all the way down here. Too late. It's not now. It was before. So this one flips between green and red mm -hmm. at every event now, which is option B. OK? Now, when I reach this point, I don't care what happens. Because I explained it. Now, it's when the students actually care. Like, I told you. You know, they go on and on. <laughs> and I'm, I just quietly walk out of the scene. <laughs> and I let, them, I let them rejoice that moment because they'll talk about it. And I need that because it generates excitement and it generates engagement. So I'm even willing to waste those 20, 30 minutes release control of the class because, ah. OK? But it's OK because I got you exactly what I want you. All right? Good. So. Let's get serious here. Let's work on the plan. Um, how do we get there? I'm going to propose to you, I'm, I want to be extremely respectful of the way you approach your teaching. All right? So don't take anything I say like you should do something. I'm just going to give you some ideas for you to think about it. Take whatever you need. Reshape it the way you, feel you see fit. Four steps. First, you have to select an objective. And this is tricky. So today, see if I manage to stick in between their ears this idea. That's your objective. OK, whatever it takes. Let's go for that. Step number two, I have to carefully think, what can they do before we meet face to face? Remember, face to face time is extremely valuable. You are not, you cannot afford to waste your face to face time. Think about that from the very dramatic point of view. I'm Spanish, so I can, I can do drama very easily. All right? Step number three, generate the challenging question. Not necessarily a question. Could, could be an activity. Could be anything. Generate that nugget. And that's what I find actually the most challenging part. Because the topic is OK. I have lots of things I have to learn about. Preliminary information, yeah, you know, you read the document. You, you, you read my PowerPoint slides from five years ago that are already there. OK, but when it comes to the challenging question, that moment, ah, that takes time. That takes a lot of time. And then think about how do you choreograph or how do you deploy that in the classroom with interaction. And try to envision what will happen. The class will get out of control for 10 minutes, for two minutes. How do I gain back the control? How long do I allow them to think about it? How long do I uh, elaborate the answer? 
do I leave some things unanswered and then go back to them? That's probably something. So, and this goes again to your comment, maybe flipping, you cannot flip just the first step and say, oh, let me come up with the object. No, you have to go all the way. It has to be complete. It has to have some sense, okay? All right, does that make sense? So the plan, and here's when you get to work. We're gonna follow those four steps. Now I want you to come up with something concrete. Think about your course. And we're gonna do something a little bit difficult here, which is you're gonna be thinking about your course, about your topic, about the kind of thing you wanna flip, but I want you to work collaboratively, even though the person next to you is not gonna be doing the same course nor the same activity. But since we're all grown-ups and we know exactly what collaborative work is, the fact that you have to explain that to the other person and kind of like collabor uh, discuss a little bit the issues, that might give you a different point of view. All right? So I know that the person sitting next to you is from, from probably totally a different school or department or whatever, but make that an advantage and come up with this activity. So I teach law. This is my activity. What do you think? Hmm, interesting. I never thought about that. Okay? So step number one. We're going to devote two, three, four minutes. Pick a topic, an objective, a concept. Don't pick lightly like the first one that comes to your mind. No, 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 no. Because you might pick a challenging one or an easy one. So careful with the choice. I mean, it shapes the activity. So think, this is something I have to convey to my students. I might have 15, 20 minutes face-to-face -face time, but I also have the opportunity to give them a reasonable amount of resources that you have to go through first. All right? Let's go. Let's give it like four or five minutes, no more than that. So, after this amount of time, you are supposed to have identified one topic, concept, objective, chunk of your class that you want to tackle with this technique. Now, a couple of things that I'll give you information because this is what I would do also in my class. Okay, let's go around and discuss something and then I'll ask you about what is your outcome. Okay, so what did you decide? I'll ask about that. But, a few things to keep in mind. Risks here. You have to keep focus. All right? We don't have enough time now to discuss all the issues surrounding the topic. No, you have to go and pick a topic. So keeping the audience focused on the task is something difficult. So now is not the time to say, oh, yeah, that topic, that's interesting. Let me tell you what happened to me one year when I was doing something like that. No, that's not the time for the anecdote. You, cannot, you don't have time for that. You have to keep on task. And this is a risk when you orchestrate your session. We can spend hours talking about how do we pick this uh, issue or this objective. And we can go on and on saying this is the wrong approach, this is the right approach. In fact, my university is not offering the right degree. Go on and on. I mean, we're all academics. We all know what we're talking about. We don't have that luxury. You have to go straight for the goal. Okay? And this is a risk you have in your class. And it's specifically high when I give this uh, talk to academics. All right? You go to the tables. It's like, no, no, this is not the objective. The objective was picking a topic. And it's not happening. Then again, you have to be aware of that. All right? So, I'm assuming you already have a topic. If you don't, just come up with one immediately. Now, let me go back to the example that we did before. What was my topic? So, without knowing, I introduced you briefly to the basic element of sequential digital logic. Okay? That was the topic I chose. Why? Because it's fundamental. My students need to know that. They need to know exactly how that little box works. And this was my objective. And this is what I decided to try with an audience that is not familiar with hardware at all. Why not? Okay? And I had to think the topic and the objective. So I want them to be able, look at the sense, to interpret the behavior of these elements, a memory element. So I need you to walk away here and say, you know, they put that box and I know now how it works. And I know that if I flick the, the light in there, not until that thing happens, then it's when it pays attention and reacts. Okay? So that was my objective. And again, it's not trivial. You might think, that's probably on your syllabus. Yes, it is. But the fact that you have to select that and have a clear idea of how to address it and uh, grasp the essence of that concept in the periphery of your, the rest of your curriculum takes time. Okay? Good. So, um, next thing, next step. And I want concrete results here, all right? So, focus. Stay focused. Now, think about the previous activities you're going to ask your students to do about that topic. Now is the time where you write a catalog, a list. You are supposed to do, do A, B, C, and D. Okay? Again, be as realistic as possible. In my view, if you have your course in mind, if you have your syllabus in mind, it will be much easier to come up with something concrete than if you start thinking about, yeah, well, maybe writing skills would be ideal. Maybe it's something that you're teaching, which is okay. But make it familiar to you. Don't make it unnecessarily complicated. All right? So we're going to devote 
three, four minutes, and I'm going to take samples this time. I'm going to say, could you please tell me what are your activities, all right? Suggestion. Try to be original. Like watching a video online, that's okay. You can do that. But maybe it's the time to, you know, go, um, go out and push your creativity and say, okay, this is the previous activity that I never occurred to me, but it might work. Who knows? Let me give you an example. I'm teaching nutrition. Any nutritionist in the room? All right, this is cooking. <laughs> Excellent. So my previous activity could be go and watch the video about the components that are present in different foods. Or my wacky activity would be get your teammates, get together, go to the supermarket and look at an aisle and one of the shelves and write down the components that you see more often. Okay? I have no idea what I'm saying, actually. or I don't know if it connects with an objective, but that's the kind of lateral thinking that you might want to try. All right? Let's devote four or five minutes and I'm going to ask for samples. Let's go. So, let's take uh, some samples of the activities that you already plan. Now, for the sake of brevity and in order to... Hello? For the sake of brevity and in order to allow as many people as possible to talk, when you describe your activity first, state your topic, even if it is totally foreign to us, it doesn't matter, topic and my activity, all right? Um, Galvin is there taking notes, so he's probably going to inform then some superiors about the quality of your solutions. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. All right, so anybody wants to go first? Any volunteers? Any activity? No, this is normal, no problem, so let's go over here. Yeah, what is your topic and activity? Topic is understanding cash flow statements. Cash flow statements, great. Uh, and so the, the activity? The activity before, I can start with a boring one of a simple demonstration so they can see how it works. But then the next one, which I'm hoping is a little bit more out there, was having students that have had experience where something's failed because the cash flow wasn't done to post those experiences online to show those other students the relevance. Writing. So they write about their activity. Right about it. Okay, great. Excellent. Good description. All right. So the topic is foreign to us, but it's still the activity makes sense. The first thing would be a video then explaining that. Yep. Excellent. Perfect. Over here. Oh, who, who raised their hand? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, so we have a business communication topic um, where, and uh, we're primarily looking at meetings. So the, the objective is um, communication in meetings. Cool. So verbal, nonverbal, uh, listening um, communication. And so the pre-activity, there, there were two pre-activities. One was to recount good and bad experiences from meetings. But the second one was to hold a meeting at home with your family with sensory deprivation. So somebody had noise cancelling headphones, somebody had a blindfold, and to then describe their, their, their experience in that meeting. They write about it. Yeah. Brilliant. Good. I think very good explanation. We all understand, even though we're not familiar with the topic, the experts. But yeah, we can understand that. And it prepares them, them to have material to discuss. So what happened there? All right. What else? Any other one? Volunteers? Um, yep. Go ahead. Uh, topic is climate change is the greatest challenge for Generation Y. Okay. Uh, and the activity is uh, search on the internet for one video by Elbow, another one by Dion Okay, so these are opposite views? Yes. All right, what do they do with that? They watch that in, and get understanding, and then the next, they have challenging questions, which tells them to do those things. Okay, so it's good to wrap it up in something that is valuable to them, right? In this case, we did write about what happened in the meeting. In this case, oh, so I'm giving you the opposite views. Don't you see the contradiction there? Tell me something, or maybe you can ask them, position yourself. Which one you think is absolutely right? And be provocative, you know, like, one of them is absolutely right. Tell me which one it is. And they'll tell you, no, 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 no. They're, none of them is absolutely right. But you get them already engaged, all right? That's a great example, too. Anybody else in the volunteer section? Yeah. Uh, I have a very simple objective. I want my students to love maths. Love maths. <laughs> and to put a sort of pre, pre work with them to ask them to go get a map of where they would like to go in the world. Excellent. Exactly. So 
I like I like I love the scenario. Just keep in mind you have to keep it bounded, right? Because we have this tendency to overprogram. So this activity looks great, but maybe you can break it into two pieces or three, and you are describing some of the things that would happen in face to face, some others that won't. But I love it. Yeah, that's a great that's a great example. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. And the objective is to revise the idea of a professional engineer. So the pre-work is to post in the welcome um, comment that Liz will do, why does a professional engineer need communication skills? Um, I, oh, sorry, sorry, no, the question is, what skills and personal qualities do you think a 21st century engineer needs? So we ask them to think about that, and they could perhaps post it online and come with that to the lecture wing or do something else. OK, good. So you gave them enough engagement with the topic. All right. Anybody, any other activities? Okay, how about here? Uh, we were, our objective, our topic, I guess, is how can we keep the side of the building cool? And uh, Excellent. our preliminary activities are just going outside with the kids and looking at what objects are already there, what, um, how to pass the beams across the sky, making a couple of preliminary measurements, and from that we're going to go on and continue. So that would give you no material for them then to engage on a much more highly cognitive uh, activity about why, the reasons why uh, the temperatures uh, change or things like that. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Um, anybody else uh, from this table? You want to go ahead? I'm going to be your problem student and say I've come here to observe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And so far, how's it going? <laughs> Are you engaged? From yeah, zero to ten? It's, it's the engagement is inside here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where it's supposed to be. <laughs> so we're doing we're doing progress there. All right, excellent. Thanks. Anybody else? This table. Yeah, okay. We're looking at um, work ready skills for graduates. So um, the topic would be um, uh, interview skills. So out of class preparation would be uh, looking at um, you know YouTube videos or other types to prepare. Okay, and that would engage in some dialogue about what do you find out there. All right. Um, another issue that you have to deal with, and I know you're fully aware with that, what happens if they don't engage? All right. So it's important to have the activity, but it's also important to have the plan B. All right. And sometimes this need for plan B might shape the activity. It's like the activity is great, but I have no way to, you know, so let me tweak this and that, and then we'll throw on top some sort of mechanism usual suspects, you know, an online quiz that you have to answer or something similar to that. And, uh, and that will promote a bit more of participation. Other recipes that I hear um, that work and I uh, practice them is don't go to class and assume that it, since most of the students didn't participate, I'm going to review the previous material. Mistake. There is friction, but you have to play with that friction, all right? Because you know how students are. If you do that the first time, next time participation in the previous activity will plummet because he's going to cover the material anyway in the first five minutes. So as long as I'm there in, on time, that's it. All right. So there has to be some sense of you missed something and you're missing something at the risk, of course, that you might be segregating some students. So you have to be careful with that. But just think of it as another knob that you can tweak and you know, put a little bit more heat on that or a, bit, a little bit less. OK, any other activity you feel like uh, sharing from this table? Yeah. Or they could come and tell us the lesson plus that they have a visit. 
Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Another thing that I'm seeing that most of you are doing, and I think is totally logical, is that rather than thinking about the, the activity in isolation, you're already hinting what is going to happen afterwards, which is good. We're going back to the notion of the system, right? It's not that I have to think my activity in isolation. I need to take into account what is going to happen in our face-to-face. -face. So I'm preparing that because in the face-to-face -face this is going to happen. And again, there will be a back and forth. So if in the face-to-face -face I plan to do this, then my activity should adapt a little bit to provide exactly the right context. Or the other way around, oh, my activity, my previous activity is reshaping like this, so I need to adjust my in-class thing because there are some things that are not properly aligned. That's perfectly normal, okay? Um, now, this exercise we did very quickly, I know, but this is something that it takes time, it takes patience, and the result sometimes is not as good as we expect. So some activities, uh, you think they're great, and you go to class, and it's like, hmm, they're not working. Now, another thing that is very typical from this paradigm is that you continuously tweak it. You continuously tune it. Okay, which is something that is common sense, but it's good to think again about it because you have many more pieces. This is a bit more complex or a, a lot, much more complex, depending on how you look at it. So you have to keep all these variables uh, and review your activities, review how they tag along with the uh, on-class participation, encouragement, is it working? I lost half of my audience, uh, therefore next time I have to do some other things, etc. All right, good. Um, tricky step. This is the most delicate step. This is the in-class activity. Now you are here on the floor. Now you have to pose some problem there or do something, step out of the scene and see if the magic happens. Okay? So I want you to think about another concrete activity and the condition is we are face to face. Um, feel free to make assumptions. My class is small and I can move the chairs. Fine. We are sitting in round tables. Fine. I have a huge theater, therefore no possibility to use the round tables. Okay, make your assumptions. It's not important. The important thing is that you feel comfortable with those assumptions and come up with a face-to-face -face activity. And then when you describe it, make sure that it has the essential element that we need to be sitting next to each other. Because if it is we come to class and we read about this, well, that's something that could be gone to the previous. All right, so keep that essence in mind. Let's work for another, let's give it a little bit more because it's a bit more challenging, five, six, Eight minutes, something like that, and then we'll come back and again explain some samples. Let's go. Time is up. Let's now look at the face-to-face -face activities you are proposing. Again, for the sake of time, we only have 15 minutes left of your very precious time, so let's go fast explaining the activities. Uh, volunteer section. Volunteer section is empty. All right, section two. You again. I'll start again. So it was something I read the other day. So the, the first activity would be putting the put into groups and one of the other three activities was to do a little test before so I had an idea about who'd done what. And then having the students that a few people have got to work with those that hadn't got it as well so that we explain through again a couple of simple problems. And then to build on that and give them a real world or a scenario with on the cash flow statement that adds a bit more complexity and that will give them a bit more time then to work. Okay, sounds a good scenario. You need the previous activities for them to warm up and have all this information. Excellent. Here, yeah. So moving on from yeah, their sensory deprivation at home, um, is they walk into a room like this where they, um, they're each table is a different department in the organisation. The organisation's decided they're going to, um, they need a new logo and each department has to have their say. They're given an agenda. Each person on the table is given a, a role. Okay, that's a good push. That's a good push for a new level. Excellent, excellent. Who else on uh, the volunteer? Uh, yeah, well, we had um, uh, students going out interviewing uh, people in, in practice, then coming back, and then uh, they can use an online tool called Poll EV. Have you heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sounds familiar. Yeah, I, yeah, I can teach that later. And um, <laughs> no, you can put the answers up there, and you see the common, uh, common like elements of the answers. All right, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's genius. <laughs> Anybody else from this table? Any volunteer? No, you already talked over there. Yeah. Uh, we'd have a debate, and the question for the or the topic for the debate is: Should we keep the carbon tax in Australia or not? Uh, for and against, and uh, that'll involve probably three people on each side. 
but the audience would then have to decide on who's, who they think is the winner. And for them to do that, they need to make or write a detailed explanation of why a particular group did well. And convince. convince yeah. All right, that's a, a good one. Let's see over there at the table, anybody? Any of the face-to-face -face activities? That's a good one? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go for it. Um, I've got an anatomy and physiology course. Oh, excellent. I'm going to do the, the cells lecture. And um, I'm going to get them perhaps to watch some videos beforehand, then come, get into groups, actually draw the cell, the structure, and then relate it to their function. Um, I was actually going to show some micrographs of different cells and get them to identify with the patient scenarios that we've got, and also do some concept maps. Okay. Oh, concept maps. Love it. Um, if you get them to draw, it's almost uh, free to get a couple of drawings and flick it through the, if you have a way of projecting, recognition and everything. Excellent. Very good ideas. Uh, that table over there. Any? Yes? Yeah. So ours um, was ethical decision making and the objective was to um, get this class to apply the um, tools of ethical decision making. And uh, so the face-to-face -face activity was... So the, the problem that we're going to look at is child labour in their um, in their company and uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. So we were going to give them each a role from one of the stakeholders, so family of the child, um, mayor of the town that's involved in the employment, um, consumer of the uh, beautiful silk blouses that are coming out from this production line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of them had to argue for keeping or minimizing or changing this uh, uh, child labor production. Very good example, and I would connect it with your comment before. Are they going to walk out? Well, I don't know, but it seems very engaging to me because if you have a discussion group and you are the major, you're like, sorry, guys, I have to go. That's like, oh. <laughs> uh, another thing that works is if you tell them to stay, they probably won't stay. But if you say, well, if you go away, then the rest of the group will, you know, they won't betray their friends. They will betray you, yeah in the split of a second, right? They say, yeah, forget it. But they're friends in the group. So this is a very good activity and creates a little bit of cohesiveness, okay? All right, excellent activities too. So I only have like 10, 12 minutes left, so I'm gonna go very quickly through a few ideas just to conclude. Um, regarding flipping large classrooms, this is a picture taken from one of the readings of the previous activities. You can always give people four cards with different colors and have 300 people voting. Okay, what we did here, you raise your hand, it scales for 300. I, I do it in a 300 lecture theater. I just say, look around, find somebody that disagrees with you. This is getting a little bit fancier because you have cards with colors. And you can look up and say, oh, mostly pink. We flopped. This is not working. Or you see the rainbow. It's like, okay, we have a lot of disagreement. This is working. Okay, so large classrooms, they can be done. You just have to be clever about how you pick your tools. Very important, the common narrative. It is not very wise to just shoot the students with this new video do first and then some questions and then discuss. It has to be a narrative. They have to perceive why is that relevant, okay? And your narrative is something very personal. I'm not going to be able to help you to articulate a statement or a set of facts that will convince your students that they need to do what they need to do. The narrative that works for me with engineers, and I kind of like um, develop it over the years, is that you're in a company, right? But before getting to a company, you have to do a job interview. So job interview, my task is for you to go to that job interview and prove that you are a good engineer and you know these concepts and you're gonna work in a hardware company. So you, know to, you need to know your hardware. So when they come back to me, and this is actually the other way around, first they came to me and said, these uh, the exercises are very difficult, they're very frustrating, and I don't know where to start. And I said, great. Are you gonna say that to your boss when you're sitting in front of your table doing the interview? Probably not, right? So what you have to do is analyze the situation, and that's the regular state of mind of an engineer. Challenging problems, we have no idea where to start, but something will come out, all right? So this is my narrative. So you have to step away from trying to convince the students that this is relevant because it's my topic, because they smell that. Just one second. So they walk in the room and say, okay, here's Waco number five today that thinks that his or her topic is the most important in the world, and that's two hours of lecture. No. You have to be an intermediary. It's like, I'm sorry, but you want to get a job, right? You want to be in the market. You want to find the thing that makes them be motivated. So I'm just an intermediary. I'll, I'll facilitate you to get there. So the narrative is very, very important. So final remarks and a few samples of what you can do out there. It's very important. You have to create your own ecosystem. So it's good to have all these tools in your pocket, then go off and design. There's no such thing as the perfect solution. If there were, I'm sure we'll all be aware of it. Okay, so you just need to tool around. And maybe what it works for one course doesn't work for the other. 
But again, you're a professional, so you'll be able to adapt. It's no problem. So some samples and how can technology can use uh, can be used. We saw here the voting platform. Some other things you can do. This is a sample of how to organize a possibility to how to organize a course. Some material out there. Typical thing, you divide it into weeks, but you organize it clearly into previews and in-class activities. So students know immediately that there is something previously that has to be done. Uh, we meet three times a week, so there'll be three sets of previous activities. Be careful how you dimension that, because we tend to over-program, all right? I would bet that nine out of 10 academics, we take the content they teach, we divide it by half, and it's still a full course. And the fact you're laughing confirms that. <laughs> Okay, so be aware of that, but you have to convey that structure very clearly to the students. Technology can help you that. You create this type of material in which they saw it clearly. They know where to go. Other tricks that you can do and technology can help you. Things like this. My sections are all folded. Why? Because I want to know if you unfold them. And I can track that. So if you go to that document and you click on the plus, then the section unfolds. Now, does that mean they read the document? Probably not, or probably yes. I don't know, but I know that most of you clicked on the form and only half of you answered the form. That's already information. So even though you might argue that that information is not entirely reliable, I would argue that it's better than having no information at all. So you put out there four activities, and one of them, you get a lot of traffic. But the fourth one, nobody clicks on that. All right, Mayday, we have an issue here. You're up for a treat. When you go to your lecture, one of your questions will flop, will fail miserably because nobody went through there. So technology can help you that. Learning analytics will help you with that. Okay, You detect activities. Videos, fancy things you can do with videos. Of course, you put up videos out there. But you can do some other interesting things, like, for example, detect when they click the play and the stop. And some of the platforms out there already give you that information. That is also very valuable information. And I'm lucky to participate with the people here at the Learning and Teaching Unit um, in a project detecting how students use those videos. We ask them to write comments, and then we analyze the comments. And we even ask them, how sure are you about your comments? Are your, is your summary accurate or not? What do you think? So we gather a lot of information. We are basically trying to establish a dialogue. And it's a very valuable dialogue because it will tell us what is happening in the previous activities. So if you see that your video is working, that you're getting the reaction you were expecting, then you go to your lecture much more confident, saying, yeah, I got my problems here. I'm going to throw your problem, these problems at you, and they're going to work. I'm going to create a type of um, situation that we experienced here an hour ago. Okay? Other tricks that technology can help you with. Well, this video, this is an example. Um, you put your webcam, you record that. I agree, it's not a Spielberg quality, right? But I had two choices. Record myself with a piece of paper and a pen in 10 minutes, or go a Spielberg production and take one year and a half. So again, you're a professional, your call. You make your choice, all right? Now you would think, yeah, but the quality is not good. It's not ideal. It is not ideal, but look, I put those uh, things in there, and they work. I got this comment this morning. Somebody said, oh, thank you. That video helped me solve my homework. Well, guess what? This is not one of my students, by the way. I'm not teaching this course, but the videos are, are out there in YouTube, all right? <laughs> so it works. Um, another thing that I found trial and error, I keep myself restricted to one single sheet of paper, which achieves two things. You have to choose carefully what you talk about, because once you run out of paper, you're not allowed to use another sheet. And the video is short. And for the 18 to 24 year olds we are handling these days, that's a plus. Okay? More things. Um, of course, you can then use some sort of engagement or technique to make sure they engage. Like, for example, some problems that they have to answer. Now, think of these problems not so much, oh, multiple choice again. Multiple choice are lame. Well, it depends on what you ask. And you are free to pose some really complicated question that needs to be answered in a fairly mm, challenging way and it's still narrow it down to an A through, through the um, uh, answer. Okay? There is a platform out there that has a very cute name. It's called Problem Roulette. Again, the physics people. So you click in there and there's problems coming at you. And they phrase it with A, B, C, and D. And they get students engaged. And then you see what is the level of engagement. Where did they go? Did they solve the tough problems? Did they solve all of them? None of them? Did they even click at all? That's already valuable information. Then you get this information reported back to you. So you get this report. Oh, most of the students are responding A, B, or C, or most of them are correct, or most of them are incorrect. Green there is correct. So you begin to detect, hmm, yeah, level of engagement, OK, but some questions are not quite working. Now, technology will help you get that information. And we might say, well, but I really don't need that type of data. But time might go by, and then they come back to you and say, you are supposed to use this data. The same way that some other professions out there, they use the data. Now, it's another tool in your pocket, very important tool. 
and specifically important for flipped classroom, where you are out there expecting people to do something. Well, you have to take a look at that. And technology is there to give you that hand. So this is an example of the type of question I bring to my class. I don't hope that you read that and understand. That is similar to the hardware question that I posed to you before. I bring five or six of them. And again, I go back home sometimes saying, oh, number three, total disaster. Didn't work. All right, but you polish it. Next year, it will be better. And they vote, and they vote hands up with this issue that first year students are very shy sometimes. So if they are the only ones answering something, they'll kick back. So what they do is, who is um, saying that option A is valid? So they do like this saying, let's see, A. If there is a boatload of us, yeah, then it's A. And if it's only me, it's like, ooh, no. All right, so you have to <laughs> deal with that. It's no problem, as long as you are aware of that. I typically organize this thing in 20 minute cycles. I give a short lecture. I hate that name, but at the end I said, all right, I'm going to put the word lecture there. So it's basically me saying, all right, we're going to talk about this topic, which you are familiar with because you did the previous activities, right? And you take the opportunity to say, at least half of you did, for them to be aware that you are aware that they didn't do it, or half of them didn't do it. Then you let them read and think alone, which is what I didn't do this here today. You think alone, so you have complete silence in the class for a very brief amount of time. They say, OK, let's vote. Find around you somebody that disagrees. And then let's discuss. Let's look from a different perspective. Let's, let's see. And then it's when the class goes wild and there is a lot of noise. Then you get control again, vote again. And then you take a look at what happened, if there is a complete change in uh, opinion or not. And then you discuss and offer the explanation that you consider fit. Again, this is just one other trick that I want you to keep in your pocket. I'm not advocating for you to go and do this all the time. Just keep in mind. And if instead of 20 minutes, you can do it in 15, perfect. And if you want the circle red instead of white, that's OK. You are the professional, all right? Um, products out there are offering already visual aid for these things. So they will give you this dashboard that will convey to you certain information about who did what, what time, how often, this type of thing. So it might be extremely valuable to you to start detecting certain patterns in certain students. And even more important, if you detect changes in those patterns. Okay, like for example, at the beginning, this student was really lagging behind, but now it's catching up. Okay, I'm about to finish. A couple of things that I would like you to take with you is flip, cl flip classroom, as we said at the beginning, is a mindset, another tool, something you take in your pocket. It is actually a specific technique that I would put underneath active or blended learning because we're asking them to do something outside. All right? There are numero dr numerous drawbacks, as you pointed out in that poll we did, but it's also Potential, there is potential for improvement. So I don't know, it's worth keeping that in mind. The challenge, like somebody already mentioned, the role definition. You have to facilitate the learning. I'm not here all the time talking to you. You were working, OK? So I have to relinquish uh, control. And the students have to be engaged. And that might be a challenge. You need to be extremely careful when you plan this. You cannot wing it, OK? If you have your PowerPoint that you know by heart, and it's Tuesday, 6 o'clock, and your lecture is at 6.05, you're totally relaxed. Why? Because they are the same 60 slides you saw last year. With this thing, it doesn't quite work like that. Every day is different. All right? So it's like shooting a movie when the movie is there forever or going every night and perform at a theater. Who knows? And that change is part of the philosophy. The technology can help. But again, it's not essential. You can dump the technology. It's no problem. Just find your recipe. And finally, I already mentioned that. If you feel that you can be replaced by a video, perhaps you should. Do you get the sense that this session could be replaced by a video? Do you get the sense that I, you got tricked because I'm not doing the work and I'm asking you to do the work? Those are the questions that the students will ask you. So basically, ask that about this seminar and find the answer because you'll have to give that answer to the students. And last thing, I would like to know your feedback. So comments, email, I'm easy to find with this name. And if you go back to the poll application, just a final round, Goodbye. Wait, 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 wait. Now is the final question that says, after this talk, I am more inclined to use the flipped classroom. I agree. I disagree. I'm totally neutral. OK? Just go ahead and answer. Excellent. And that'll be all. I, I'll appreciate any kind of feedback, Twitter, email, whatever. I'll be more than glad to to have your answers and your comments. All right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, okay, yes. thank you for coming today. And very big special thanks to Everlardo. He's given us a very Two minutes. Uh, enthusiastic and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.